Okay, great. We have a minute after and it looks like our participants are starting to slow down a little bit. So why don't we get started? Hello, everyone. My name is Erin Black. I'm the Associate Director for Policy Partnerships and Recruitment for our CDC Division of Scientific Education and Professional Development. Thank you for joining us. Reminder, this is an opportunity for you to hear about what it's like to be a real disease detective in CDC's Epidemic Intelligence Service. You'll hear a brief overview of our EIS program and then meet some of our current EIS fellows to hear about their personal experiences in the program. And there'll be time at the end for you to ask questions. Our time is limited, so we ask that your questions tailored to our panel's personal experiences in the program, questions about application requirements, eligibility, timelines, and other program specific questions can be answered by visiting our website, www.cdc.gov EIS, or you can send program questions to our mailbox at EIS application at cdc.gov. So now to get us started with a brief overview of the EIS program, I'll now hand it over to our moderator, Captain Eric Pesner, Chief of Epidemiology Workforce Branch and the Epidemic Intelligence Service Program. Kick us off, Eric. Thanks, Aaron. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and share some slides with you to get this started. All right, so welcome, everybody. Either uh, good afternoon or good morning, possibly, wherever you are in the world. We're excited to talk to you about our CDC's Disease Detective Training Program, the Epidemic Intelligence Service. If you think about just about any major public health event, CDC and EIS were likely there, whether it's dating back to 1966, working on the initiation of smallpox eradication, jumping ahead to 1981, to the first reported case of HIV and AIDS, jump to 2014 in Ebola in West Africa, or most recently the COVID-19 response. Our officers are there and in many cases very heavily involved in the investigation, the analysis response, and the public health actions that come from that work. So, EIS is really about response and service. And response can take the form of like our officers here out in the field, sitting at a desk, analyzing data, can involve collecting samples, or can involve working on really complicated, sometimes messy data, and trying to answer really important questions. And these are the skills that we try and work with you to build as applied epidemiologists. So where can you work? It's a two-year training program. And your placement is either at CDC headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia, that little gold star there in Georgia. We have other CDC regional locations in West Virginia, in Hyattsville, Maryland, in Colorado, Fort Collins, and uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, and Anchorage, Alaska. Those were all those little gold stars on the map. We also place officers at state or local health departments. And where we have officers in our 2022 20, and 2021 classes are in any of those states where you're seeing blue. We also have a combined local and federal position with that little blue circle out there in, in California. And you'll see that um, there's quite a range of options. So at a minimum for EIS training, you're, you're gonna start out with your one month intensive course in Atlanta, and then you're gonna report to where you end up matching to. We'll talk a little bit about that later, how that happens. But again, you're either at a CDC headquarters, a regional location, or at one of these state or local health departments. So to be an EIS officer, we are looking for people that have a doctoral degree. Unless you are in the nursing field, then you can still be eligible. And people are coming in from a variety of fields, whether it's as a physician, veterinarian, nurse, microbiologist, PhD level epidemiologist. We're bringing in people with a diverse set of skills because what's asked of us require diverse backgrounds and a variety of viewpoints. So why would you wanna do EIS? Well, it's a great opportunity to come and work at CDC or state or local health department where you are providing service while training on the job. And there's really nothing like it because what's really special about this program is you're gonna get assigned to extraordinary supervisors that have a range of opportunities lined up for you. Some that we can anticipate, others that we cannot, that will just emerge during your training. Every single class always has some major public health event that we can't anticipate that ends up taking a lot of time and ends up really shaping that class. What we can assure you is you're getting subject matter experts as your supervisors 
that you're going to be working with and training under and learning on the job. So where could EIS take you? Well, it is truly a pathway to extraordinary futures. 95% of our graduates continue in public health related positions. Four of the last 11 CDC directors have been EIS alumni and greater than 40% of the scientific executive leadership at CDC are EIS alumni. So we're really looking for people, extraordinary people like the current officers that we have that want to apply the training they've already received, get additional training in applied epidemiology and really come in and wanna make a difference because what this program is really about is service. Service to the American people, service to the state or local health department and service to our international partners. And as Aaron mentioned, if you wanna learn more, there's a lot of information at cdc.gov backslash EIS. And we also have a range of other fellowships in our division and at the agency. So you can always go to cdc.gov backslash fellowships to learn a lot more about the range of opportunities that we have available for you at CDC. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. And what's I think the most exciting part about this webinar for all of you today is the opportunity to hear from some of our current officers. And we have three officers here for you today. Uh, they have a diverse uh, set of skill sets as far as before they came to EIS and also what they gained while they've been at EIS. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna ask Miriam to introduce herself. She's gonna to talk to you a little bit about her background, about her current assignment at CDC and a little bit about some of the work that she's been doing. So Miriam, if you could go ahead, please. Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Miriam Van Dyke. I'm a second year EIS officer. I am assigned to CDC headquarters in the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control in the Division of Balance Prevention. Um, I came to public health uh, through my initial experience doing research on racial disparities and cancer um, outcomes back when I was an undergrad. I kept going to my MPH in epidemiology as well as my PhD in epidemiology at Emory and decided I wanted some more applied experience and making data actionable. And so currently in my current assignment, I work with two major surveillance systems looking at violent death and analyzing contextual factors that contribute to experiences of violence outcomes. So. Thanks, Miriam. So, you know, a lot of people think of EIS and, and what we've known historically for is outbreak investigations and infectious disease. But hopefully you've just heard and picked up from Miriam that we have a range of opportunities at CDC. So Miriam's working on injury and violence, but we also have positions in environmental health, a uh, number of chronic disease positions, occupational health. So we're a lot more than infectious disease. There's a range of opportunities with a much greater attention now on health equity and focusing on other issues like racism as a public health issue is also something that's a, a big focus for EIS now as well. So thanks again, Miriam, for that brief introduction. Now let's go over to Ariella. And so you've heard a head headquarters officer, and now you're going to hear from one of our officers that's at a, a state and local health department. Thanks, Eric. Good afternoon, everybody. It's so nice to have you all here and to get to talk a little bit more about the EIS program. Um, a little bit briefly about me. I am also a PhD epidemiologist. Um, years ago, maybe like you, I thought I was going to be a clinician. I left undergrad and worked for a year in a psychiatric clinic and decided that I was better with population health um, for my own personal mental health because I could not separate myself from the people I was caring for and not worrying about them. So I moved into public health have my master's and um, PhD in epidemiology. Um, just a quick comment on that. You don't have to have a PhD in epidemiology to do EIS. I think the uh, makeup of this panel maybe leans, leans a little heavy towards that, but actually in general, that's not the most common to have a PhD in epidemiology. Um, I worked for two years in a state health department before joining EIS. And the reason I wanted to do EIS was because I wanted more applied experience. I was in a very niche area. Typically when you have a job, of course, you work in a specific pathogen area and I was working in healthcare associated infections. And I decided that I would like to get more applied experience and kind of stretch myself outside of the normal bounds of a PhD FE. Um, and I'm very glad I did. I'm assigned out in Arizona um, with the state and local health department. I'm actually a split position between Maricopa County, the largest county and the state health department. Um, and that's 
where I currently sit have had an incredible experience, mostly infectious disease, a little bit of health equity. It's been wonderful. Thanks, Ariel. Um, and now we're going to kick it over to Richard, who's our last panelist, who's also um, outside of CDC, out at a, at a health department. And Richard, why don't you go ahead and, and share your background, please? Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to see everyone. Um, my name is Richard Dadan. I'm an uh, EIS officer, and I'm assigned to the Communicable Disease Program at the Chicago Department of Public Health. Um, I am an infectious disease epidemiologist. I have a PhD and a master's in public health degree in epidemiology. Um, prior uh, to joining CDC, um, my main kind of research and experience was mostly in clinical research. Um, I oversaw several uh, clinical trials on HIV medications um, and also uh, oversaw a lot of clinical cohort studies. And the reason I decided to do EIS was um, for my dissertation. I, uh, I worked with uh, the DC Department of Public Health uh, to merge some of my, uh, some of the clinical data that I was working on um, and I merged it with the local public health data. And that really intrigued me. And I decided that I, I wanted applied epidemiology experience it, uh, in a local or state health department. And that's why I decided to apply to the EIS program. And um, now that I am on off, an officer in Chicago, um, my main role has been helping Chicago with their COVID-19 response. And my main kind of focus has been leading um, their outbreak investigations that, um, uh, outbreak investigations of COVID-19 in congregate settings. So that includes like skilled nursing facilities, schools, um, daycares, uh, and also responses to like large public events like Lollapalooza or uh, street festivals. So uh, that's kind of what's been keeping me busy the last few years. Thanks, Richard. So when you're accepted into EIS, you're in the program. And after that, as far as where you're assigned, depends upon you going through, there, there's two ways you can get assigned to your position. One is through the pre-match process, and the other is what we call our regular match. So we normally have a select number of positions that we make available each year for the pre-match. Some of those tend to be at state or local health departments. They sometimes hard to fill or a priority to fill in a given year, or some positions at the agency that also can be hard to fill or that are a real priority for the agency to make sure we have an officer placed there. And so we have a select number of positions that you can go ahead and express your interest for. You go ahead and after you express your interest, you may go ahead and interview for those. You interview and then you go ahead and you rank them and the positions rate you and we have an algorithm that then matches things. So if you, if you do the pre-match, that's oftentimes sometime in November, then you know where you're going and you're done. If you choose to wait, then you go into the regular match. It normally happens at our in-person conference. When we have our in-person conferences that we hopefully will be resuming in 2023. And you come to that conference and during the conference or that week with all their officers, they're presenting uh, the work that they've been doing, like a normal scientific conference. There's also matching and interviewing going on. So you'll spend the week getting the no positions, talking to people at the end of the week, you have to interview for some positions. And again, you go ahead and rank your list of positions they rate you and we run an algorithm and match you to your position. So that's how you either end up uh, in the, the position that you uh, that the officers are in today. So Miriam, why don't you talk a little bit about why is it, how did you end up choosing uh, the position uh, that you're currently matched with? Sure, so again, I'm in the Division of Violence Prevention in the Injury Center. Um, I'm assigned with the surveillance branch um, two main reasons for me, and I, and I pre-matched, so I knew in November, December where I was going to be. Um, the supervisors, specifically, I felt that they were, would be very supportive and um, had an emphasis in, in um, supporting of health equity. And I think also the topic matter of violence um, was different enough from what I had been doing, which was cardiovascular disease epi, um, but it had a lot of um, overlap with a lot of the exposures and policies that I've, I'm interested in. Um, so for example, one of the analyses I do now looks at homicides experienced by black males. And that work will actually be presented during the EIS conference, you know, little plug there, um, on May 2nd. But there's an emphasis on 
yes, the individual risk factors that can lead someone to experience violence, but also the structural factors and policies, history that has led people to live in certain areas, have certain experiences. And I knew my division had um, was very supportive of exploring that and had available data, um, surveillance system, national violent death reporting system that could support my analysis of things I wanted to look at. So. Thanks. And so, uh, you know, Miriam just described the position that she became interested in, you know, why she matched to a headquarters position. Ariel, why don't you describe why did you go ahead and end up at a position outside of CDC headquarters? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so I mentioned previously that I worked in a state health department prior to joining the EIS program. And when I approached the match process that Eric described, I was very open minded looking at headquarters and field, what do we call field sites or state and local health departments. And I ended up ranking pretty much only state and local health department sites because I liked the idea of being a generalist. So in the EIS program, you're afforded the opportunities to meet certain core activities of learning. So we all are trying to gain the same skills, but there's different ways that we can do that. And by being seated in a state or local health department, or in my case, both, um, you get the opportunity to work across various pathogens and comorbidities, et cetera. So I've been fortunate in that I've been able to work on COVID-19 alongside sexually transmitted infections. I've looked at health equity. I have worked on um, adverse childhood experiences. I've gotten to do um, healthcare associated infections. So I chose to lean towards state and local health sites for the um, generalist experience of being able to work across various morbidities and mortalities, but also for the fact that this is where a lot of um, public health work is done. Federal agencies are important. CDC is incredibly important, is a fantastic resource for state and local health departments. Um, but state and local health departments have to execute a lot of the initiatives and recommendations and tailor it for their unique settings. And um, I wanted that experience of learning how to tailor it to um, a state or local health department. How do you work with the public? How do you make sure that the needs are being met for your region? Great. Thanks, Ariella. So, you know, once you're in EIS, again, that sometimes that's the most difficult first decision you have to make is that do you want to take a position at CDC headquarters or one of our regional offices where you're really going to become a subject matter expert, sometimes a limited, very focused area? Or do you want a position like Ariella or Richard has where on any given day, whatever's walking in the door might be thrown at you. So you have to be really flexible and you're really working much closer in that in much more applied sense often. So thank you very much. The questions are coming into the chat. That's great. I've got a lot of questions lined up, but if you've got important questions, we're glad to take those, keep throwing them in the chat. So Richard, I'm gonna throw this question at you since you can answer it. The, some people are asking if you already have a degree in epidemiology, it, what sort of additional training did you get as far as epidemiology in EIS and did you find it repetitive? Yeah, sure. Um, so I have found EIS to be a vehicle in which it, it really not only gave me uh, the ability to apply my experience in epidemiologic methods and uh, my ex the academic training I received in data analysis. Um, I, it's it's really given me the opportunity to apply all of those skills, and I think that is one of the important kind of um, the the benefits of doing a program like EIS is that it's very different than the academic training that you get at a PhD program or even the type of experience that you have doing like a postdoctoral fellowship. Uh, at a university uh, doing um, doing that type of research. It's, it's really different um, type of work. Uh, on a daily basis, I am working with surveillance data um, on a multitude of different diseases. Um, similar to uh, Ariella, I was really looking for an experience where I would be able to work on multiple diseases, multiple kind of topic areas. I had previously only kind of worked on like HIV, STI type of work, and I really wanted to kind of broaden my experience. Um, so in my time as an EIS officer, I've been able to apply a lot of the same, same skill sets and the same type of kind of research experience that I uh, did as an HIV researcher during my academic program to other diseases and um, that's that's been very beneficial, I feel, um, 
and I think it's made me a better epidemiologist and I also have a better appreciation of how federal and state level public health works. Great, thanks Richard. We don't have a nurse on today's panel, so I apologize. So I'm gonna channel my inner nurse to try and answer some of the nursing questions for coming in here. And I can tell you that there is great appreciation for all the various professions we recruit into EIS and we try and treat them all equally. So there's not any bias. Uh, someone asked, are there, are there different types of opportunities for nurses versus others? You know, sometimes there are certain opportunities that they need someone with clinical skills. So we may send someone that is trained as a physician or a nurse or in some cases a veterinarian because those clinical skills are needed. Other times there's some advanced analytic technique that's needed. So we might send a PhD in, in epidemiology. Other times they might need someone who's got a lot of experience with collecting samples. So, so someone that has trained as a microbiologist, we might send. So a lot of times what the needs of the uh, response is will dictate who is sent, but nurses are valued equally like everyone else that's recruited into the program. So you don't need to worry about uh, any bias uh, for or against nurses, and we really encourage them to apply. They had great value and have been very successful in our program. So uh, Miriam, one of the questions we're getting is, can you talk about what is a, what is a typical day like for you at C working at CDC headquarters? Yeah, so I'm, so I'm at CDC headquarters, which is different than Ariella and um, Richard. Um, and one thing to note that when you are at the CDC headquarters, you are working closely with your home team. So I analyze data from surveillance systems, um, work on reports, writing reports, um, conducting evaluations of how um, well the surveillance systems work to identify what we're trying to quantify. Um, so for example, the evaluation of one surveillance system to identify emergency department visits for firearm injuries. Um, and I would say, so that's my primary work, but at the same time, we're also allowed to deploy to the field, uh, deploy to the remote um, emergency operations center to help with COVID. Um, and so those experiences look completely different than my day-to-day -day where I'm behind a computer analyzing data. Those experiences might be more what Richard and Ariella are working on, going to the field, talking to people um, in the community, collecting data with partners, doing community testing, whatever the needs might be. Um, and those are you know, unique experiences that you still can get while at the headquarters, um, but day to day could look like sitting behind your computer and analyzing and evaluating data. Thanks, Miriam. So to, to contrast that, um, Richard, why don't you share your day to day given you're out of the health department? Sure, yeah, I think, um, so as a field officer, I have a couple of different projects that I lead on a day-to-day -day basis. However, um, depending on uh, what happens on that day, kind of my entire workday could be um, unpredictable. So uh, one of the things as, as the officer in the communicable disease program, if there's a foodborne outbreak, if there's a um, outbreak of Le Legionnaire's disease, um, specifically with COVID, uh, if there was ever an outbreak that occurred on, um, in any type of congregate setting, uh, I would receive an email or a phone call immediately and be asked to like drop everything and work on the outbreak and lead a team to investigate the outbreak. And that kind of really shapes uh, your day-to-day -day is if you're working on an outbreak investigation, that is what you concentrate your time on. And then once you have some downtime, once we're, um, once a wave uh, of a specific variant uh, start to start, starts to calm down, then I can go back to my regular day-to-day -day projects. Um, but yeah, I think um, I was, I wanted an unpredictable work day, and that's kind of why I wanted to be a field officer. And that's exactly what I've, I've, uh, the situation I've gotten myself into and I enjoy my day to day. It's unpredictable. And um, I always like to tell the story that like my first Friday at the Chicago Department of Public Health was my first outbreak investigation. I got a phone call at 4 p.m. and, and um, it was one of the most kind of exciting investigations I've had since uh, being an EIS officer. It was uh, examining a COVID outbreak that happened between two soccer teams, a male and a female soccer team. Um, and that was my first kind of outbreak investigation. And um, they, someone, one of the medical directors here told me, take the lead on this. And uh, I ran with it and I've 
been doing the same type of work uh, for the last two years. That's great. Thank you, Richard. Uh, does anyone want to comment on someone's asking, what are the advantages of the pre-match versus regular match? One of the officers want to take that? I can take it. Um, happy to take a step. So I will admit I did not pre-match. Um, I can give my point of view of what could be great about pre-matching versus regular matching. Um, so one of the wonderful things about pre-matching is you will know way before everybody else where you're moving and what you're, who you're going to be working with and what you're going to be working on. Um, one of the great things about pre-match sites as well is that those are sites where there's a high, there are the program and the um, supervisors have been there's a high need for an officer. So there's never a shortage of work in any EIS site, but particularly for pre-match pre sites, they need the public health support and there's going to be a lot of opportunity there. Um, so I think that some of the advantages to consider, um, it is an abbreviated list compared to the regular match process, um, but it is advantageous, particularly if you have a, a partner or a family that you need to consider for relocation um, and you are interested in a specific area that can kind of help you narrow it down a little bit sooner as opposed to the regular match process. The regular match has more positions available. Um, and I, I want to make sure that I'm very clear in my message that every site's a great site. Like the program has done a wonderful job and there's a strong alumni network to help support these sites. And a, most, a lot of EIS supervisors are former EIS alumni themselves. Um, so I think that considering that pre-match sites are very much a high need site, there's plenty to do. So your opportunities would kind of be endless in a way in terms of what they need support with, depending on the scope of where you're assigned. Thanks, Ariella. Uh, you know, we've had a number of questions also about, you know, people are early in their career and are thinking about in advance of EIS and what can you do to get ready? And some people want CDC experience. And again, if that's something you want, Again, I encourage you to go check out the website, cdc.gov backslash fellowships. We have a range of opportunities for you to get some CDC experience. My recommendation is for anybody that wants to work at CDC one day, the best thing that you could be doing right now is gaining experience at a state or local health department. So find ways to get that public health experience there because um, that is invaluable if you ever wanna work at CDC one day. Because if you don't have an understanding and an appreciation for how difficult public health is, at the state or local level, you're going to have a real hard time being successful at CDC. So I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, another, there's, we had some additional questions about pre-match. Just to be clear, you're reviewing, once you're accepted in the ES and you're reviewing these positions, the positions are either at headquarters or one of our regional locations or a state or local health department. So you, you know where it's located. And so you're choosing, if you choose to list all headquarters positions, then when we run the match, it's highly likely is that you're going to you're going to match to only the positions you interview with so you're going to end up at a headquarters position. If you rank all state or local public health departments, you're going to end up with one of those. If you do a mix, then you could end up in Atlanta or a regional location or a state or local health. Department. So it really matters what position you're interested in is how the match plays out. Again, you interview for the positions and you rank them from 1 to however many you interview for, usually between 6 and some people up to 10. And they're going to give you a rating and we run that algorithm and, and we try and give everybody their highest match as possible. And that's how it, it, you figure out where you end up. Uh, there was another question. Uh, let's see. Uh, there was a question about how many officers per class we have. Uh, our current class size of the current officers are ranged from 60 to 65. And the incoming class we have for 2022 is going to be larger because some increased funds we got as a result of the pandemic. And so that class size is going to be 88. But generally, our class size is in the 60s. Um, but we're going to have larger class sizes for the next couple of years. So let's see. Does anybody want to comment on this question about what does career progression look like after EIS? So what have you observed as officers? Anybody want to comment on that? Well, I think it depends on the route that people decide to take. Um, I know at least for at headquarters, a lot of people um, who decide they want to stay at CDC um, end up um, working and becoming a team lead pretty quickly. Um, 
leading surveillance systems, leading other initiatives, um, doing a lot of the work that you do in EIS, but as like your full-time job and very focused. Um, and maybe Ariel or Richard know more about outside of CDC, what the trajectory looks like. I know there are many state epidemiologists who lead the public health department in their state or you know, in jurisdictions and counties that are EIS alums. Um, and so I think it really just depends on what path you would like to take and the things that you value along the way that can kind of choose where you, where you go. So. I can talk a little bit about um, the Chicago Department of Public Health and um, the, the different kind of positions that are available here. Um, so here in Chicago, um, our commissioner, three of our medical directors, um, actually four of our medical directors are all EIS alumni. Um, so they've all done the EIS program. They chose to, uh, and they either were um, the officers at, at the Chicago Department of Public Health or the Illinois Department of Public Health. And they all chose to stay in, in the Chicago region. And, um, and it, it's been very, it's been very helpful and uh, exciting to work with former EIS officers. And so that, that kind of gives a little bit of perspective of the type of jobs that, that some of our former officers have, um, have pursued after the program. Uh, also, I, I do want to mention that there's also, um, it's called a, a CFO, a career epidemic, epidemic uh, field officer, which is um, a CDC employee who is assigned to a local or state health department and um, does ve very similar work to what an EIS officer does, but uh, instead of a two-year assignment, it's more of a, a full-time position. Thank you both. So yeah, a I, lot of our officers go, oh, Ariel, go ahead. No, sorry, that's what I get for phone audio connection delay. Um, I just wanted to add that, you know, if you're assigned out in a state or local health department, Arizona has had EIS officers for many years and they've ended up on very many different tracks. Um, some have returned to federal agencies, so they work now at CDC. Some have left the governmental sector altogether and do public health through other work, such as NGOs or nonprofits. Um, some even EIS officers, former EIS officers work for pharmaceutical companies, go into industry, et cetera. So I think you know, don't, um, you're not limited by the position in which you choose within EIS of for what track you take after. Um, you can take those skills with you and really um, are very interoperable throughout government health at any level. Thanks, Eric, sorry. No, sure, thank you. So many of our graduates, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, the majority stay in public health after. And they either stay at CDC, they go to state or local public health departments, they may take international positions with the World Health Organization, PAHO, other places. Some may go to academic positions. Some may go to nonprofits, uh, pharmaceuticals. So there are a variety of opportunities, but this is a launching pad and accelerator for people's career in many ways, having done EIS, given the opportunities that you get during the program that really give you great experience and the extraordinary people we're able to recruit into the program. We're getting a number of questions about, are you eligible? Please go to cdc.gov backslash EIS. It's gonna give you all the eligibility criteria because there's a lot of caveats for different people. So we're not gonna be discussing that at all today. So check out the EIS website and you'll get all of your information about eligibility. There was also a question about someone having training in environmental science, uh, policy and management. Are people like that eligible for EIS? Absolutely. And again, you can check out all the eligibility criteria. We're looking for people from a diverse um, range of backgrounds that have a passion for service and for public health. Does that mean you have to have a lot of prior public health experience? No, we have a lot of people that come in with very little public health experience, but it's something that they're able to convince us they have a passion for service and they're able to be very articulate about how they're gonna take our training and do something really meaningful with it. So uh, this question is going to be for you, Miriam, because it's for those who are based at CDC headquarters. Do you get to choose to pursue deployments as they come up, or are they assigned to you? So um, at least with the COVID-19 response, um, there was all hands on deck situation, and many people deployed. And through that, you could inquire and 
be assigned to a deployment, but also depending on your skill set, sometimes people will reach out to you to request um, your assistance. I think so one example um, through EIS, um, I was deployed in November of 2020, early in the pandemic, where we validated Binex Now rapid antigen tests. Um, that was through one of the task force working on the COVID-19 response. And I was deployed with a number of people, um, lab scientists, as well as fellow EIS officers. Um, for that, I applied for it. Um, my supervisors were supportive of me getting that experience, particularly field experience as an epidemiologist who has worked behind the computer often. Um, another experience I was requested just because I've been working alongside um, many of the partners in Hawaii and worked with their health department for a month on investigations. So it really just depends on the skills you're wanting to get, as well as what you've been doing through your two years of EIS. Thanks, Miriam. Um, so Richard or Ariel, do you wanna, we have a question about what analytic skills you gain, uh, you, you, the training you receive from EIS and what statistical package uh, uses. Either one of you wanna tackle that question? Maybe we can tag team it, Richard, since we're both <laughs> smiling at each other. Um, so the program, um, I am a little biased because I have a PhD in epidemiology. So writing, writing SAS code, for example, was something that I was very comfortable with coming into the program. Um, the program during a, we have a month long training that kind of kicks off your EIS experience and they did offer ample opportunity to help train persons without any statistical program experience. Um, we use at my state and local health department primarily SAS. Um, R is also accepted, not as widely used. Um, so that there's opportunities for support for training. CDC, from what I hear, also has opportunities for coursework to help support learning those statistical programs and softwares. Um, one of the great things about positions, though, during recruitment is they will clearly state to you who can help support you through that process. Um, so say you come in without a lot of statistical programming experience, you can then speak with the person who will help support you through learning how to code appropriately, how to choose the right statistical models, et cetera, for your project. Within my experience here for these last two years, I've mostly worked on things um, within kind of logistic regressions and modeling that I was comfortable with during my program. Um, and that was because I prioritized other experiences over a very like deep analytical experience into maybe like negative binomial modeling, which I haven't done before. So the nice thing is that you can tailor the experience to kind of go deeper into some skills if you would like. I chose for more practical, um, outbreak investigations kind of applied health and stayed more as kind of the low level of regression modeling. Richard, do you have anything you want to add? No, I would just say um, my experience has been very similar to Ariella. I have, uh, as someone who has a PhD in epi, I, um, I had a lot of experience uh, both academic and applied in using SAS. Um, so that's kind of where, how, what skill set I came into the EIS program with. And um, I too, over the last two years, I've chosen to pursue um, more applied work versus trying to grow my analytic, analytic skills, mostly because I felt like my academic training gave me that experience as well. However, I would say, uh, so Chicago also has another EIS officer. So Chicago has two. Um, I'm the second year, there's a first year. Um, the first year officer does not have as much experience in SAS or R coding. And um, so she has chosen to build that skill set and it works closely with our uh, director of epidemiology and trying to build up that, that skill set that she did not have. Uh, she's an MD by training, so she did not have much experience in SAS. Um, so I would say I I'd very much agree with Ariel in terms of the the opportunities to pick and choose what type of training and um, you, you want and the type of opportunities you want to pursue while you're in the IS officer. Thank you. Um, we have a number of questions about international work. Uh, so we have officers that are matched to international positions located at CDC. So we have a Center for Global Health 
And so you could be matched to a position at CDC where you're focused on global work. You're doing it from Atlanta and you're traveling overseas, some positions quite a bit. We do not have any positions where you are permanently assigned overseas. All of our positions are, are um, located in the United States or our territories. So we do not have any in other countries. And we welcome international applicants. There's a lot of questions about that. Every year, yes, we do accept international applicants. They have to compete like everybody else and we select the best applicants. And so uh, eligibility criteria, again, are on our website. There's also a question if we can give us some examples of how MDs, vets, RNs use clinical skills in their roles. Uh, any of our current officers wanna respond to that? So I don't personally have an MD. I don't know if um, Richard or Ariella have them there. But um, in my recent deployment, I was uh, deployed with a first year officer who does have a clinical background in emergency medicine. And we were deployed to the Republic of Palau to help them with one of their first occurrences of community transmission of COVID. And Palau is a Pacific Island, um, almost near Philippines. But while um, myself and another EIS officer who has an EPI background was helping with testing logistics, conducting testing, um, helping analyze surveillance data, that EIS officer with a clinical background was able to work with the hospital partners to look at the clinical records to evaluate um, characteristics of patients who were admitted because of COVID and um, also vaccine related um, outcomes and just to be able to provide recommendations based on their first hospitalized cases of COVID, um, how to prepare for anything coming. So just her background with clinical um, and just like medical chart abstraction review was completely valuable um, in that setting. And we didn't even know it to begin with. So yeah, um, very useful, especially on diverse teams. So. I'm a non-clinician as well. I'm trained as a behavioral epidemiologist and I was did my EIS in global tuberculosis and focused on TB and HIV globally. And when I started EIS, I couldn't tell you anything about tuberculosis. I didn't know anything about drug resistance. I couldn't tell you about transmission, latent versus active disease. I didn't know any of these things. So I had to learn quite a bit and I relied quite heavily on my ES colleagues who were clinicians. And what I can tell you is they were much more involved. While I would help more with analytic capacity with working with ministries of health, they were much more involved in things as far as helping doing trainings and assisting clinicians on how better to read uh, chest radiographs, interpretation of laboratory tests, thinking about drug resistance profiles, things that I had no capacity for responding to. So there's a variety of positions where our clinicians are still applying their clinical training. Sometimes you also have to be involved in collecting specimens, uh, including blood and, and other things that clinicians can do that, that I did not. And also some of our uh, clinicians still do limited clinical practice while they're doing EIS, sometimes as part of their related to their positions, other times completely separate. So there's an opportunity to maintain those clinical skills and we encourage that, but there's no shortage of opportunities. We have things where we have docs on call for, for uh, clinical consultation teams, for example, early on in COVID and even still today where clinicians are calling and getting guidance from CDC. And we have that for a variety of conditions where we have clinicians on call to provide guidance. So there's great opportunities for, for clinicians. Uh, there's also questions about, are we virtual or in person? You need to report physically to whatever location you're assigned to, but a number of our officers do do a fair amount of telework from where they're working and some people are going in every day. It really just depends on the position. Someone asks, is there an age limit for EIS? There is not. And the other question was about our acceptance rate. So, you know, we tend to have anywhere from 500 to the high 300s of applicants. And our class size, again, is from, you know, 60 or this next class is, is going to be 88. So that gives you a sense of the acceptance rate. Someone asked is, how is inclusivity fostered? And are people with disabilities considered? Yes, uh, people, uh, again, we're accepting the most qualified candidates 
and there aren't any disabilities that would exclude people from EIS, we encourage everyone to apply. And way we're really fostering inclusivity, one perfect example is this. We started having a series of webinars like this. We have two, one which is like this, just a background about EIS. Another is tips for applying and, and for completing your application. And we started that because we wanted to more level the playing field for applicants. In the past, you could only get this type of information if you knew a current officer or an alum. And we started having these web, webinars really to foster uh, more inclusivity. So we're doing a number of things. We also have a EIS, DEIA council that includes members of the current uh, officer classes that guide the program in a number of areas as we look to infuse DEIA principles into everything we do from how we recruit, select, train, and support uh, even officers after they graduate. So uh, our officers, what recommendations do you have for people to be competitive for applying to us? What would you recommend to people looking to you? I can give it a first shot here. Um, so I have this conversation fairly regularly, um, whether it be somebody that's a friend of a friend or someone reaching out via LinkedIn, et cetera. And I think the best thing you can do to be competitive is think about what can you bring to this program and what can this program give to you? I think the biggest mistake I've seen when seeing folks apply and reading personal statements for some for people applying is that they're talking a little too much either about one way or the other. So they are either very trained and they aren't sure why they need the EIS program or they're too almost humble about their experiences and look like they don't have the kind of skill sets needed to be a strong EIS officer. Um, I think showing adaptability is important. Um, and that you work well on a team. There is absolutely no solo sport in public health. Um, there's nothing that you're gonna do solely by yourself and that you need to show that you are, can be a member of a team and do well. And that team can succeed some adversities you've overcome. So those are just some kind of off the cuff thoughts. But I think understanding what you can gain from the program and the skills you're bringing forward and marrying that together well. Great. Uh, we have a question about what length of time are external assignments usually? I, I assume they're referring, referring to an outbreak investigation or a deployment. So you, uh, officers, you want to share your experience or what have been your, your durations of your various uh, deployments or investigations? I can share. Um, I would say that as a field officer, I... Uh, unlike a head covers officers where um, I have to, you would have to deploy to get the field experience. It, it's, it's kind of, you reverse that a little bit. Um, uh, as a field officer, I, I typically work on all outbreak investigations within the city limits of Chicago. Um, so it's a little bit of a different experience, but I would say that in terms of like outbreak investigations, it, the length of time varies depending on the nature of the investigation. Um, also, there could be additional kind of research questions that come up from an investigation that kind of prolong um, the work that you're doing in a specific topic area. I would say that as an EIS officer in 2020 and 2021, my entire time has been on the COVID response. So it's been a two year kind of um, <laughs> deployment for, for me. However, uh, there's been several projects within that, within that experience. So um, an outbreak investigation, the quickest one I've done is like two weeks. Um, and actually from the start of the outbreak investigation to like publishing an MMWR, that was three weeks, uh, which was insane. But then I've also had projects that have taken like six months. So uh, just really depends on what's going on at the moment. And uh, what the research and scientific priorities are at CDC, but also kind of what's going on in the field at the moment. Thanks, Richard. So, I'll, you know, I'll say that generally we have officers that can deploy for sometimes as short as a week, and sometimes things can be up to six weeks or in rare cases, a little bit longer. But most field deployments officers tend to do tend to be about three, two to three weeks if they're going from their position somewhere else. Uh, who wants to comment on work life balance? I can try, and then I'm going to ask my fellow officers to tag in here. Um, 
So I think that work-life balance, just like with any job, but particularly in this fellowship, is very much driven by you. Um, there is a culture within EIS for all high achievers, all folks who really want to be involved. You've got two years to maximize. And so I think that your supervisors will help guide you to having good work-life balance, um, but that is very much within your decision-making. I am someone to share it. Like I have children, I have animals, like I've got the whole shebang here with me in Arizona and I'm able to have a life outside of work that's very full. So I think that's where a lot of those questions often come from is, am I able to continue to have a life outside of work, outside of public health? And I am proof that yes, you can. Um, and I want to defer over to Richard and Miriam to add as well, but I think, you know, recognize that you're in, in control of that. People can have work-life balance within this program. Yeah, I completely agree with Ariella. Um, and it is up to, to you and often, well, sometimes I will say there are deadlines <laughs> um, that we have to, you know, you gotta kind of push, push the gas and, and, and do it. But we, we do it in service for other people and for our communities. And I think that, you know, during the times where there isn't potentially a work-life balance, um, I think that makes it the, the most worthwhile. Um, so, but most of the time I, I work the, the normal um, hours from eight to five, eight to 4.30 or whatnot. Um, field deployments, we do sometimes work on the weekends and evenings to get things done. Um, but again, that's like very isolated um, instances. So. And obviously during COVID, it's been different. I think a lot of our officers have been increased demands. A lot of their supervisors have been working extraordinary hours and there's been this increased pressure that officers have felt that they had to work even more hours and that work-life balance has been challenged. You've heard from a couple of officers here that have done a great job, but there's no doubt this has been a challenge for a lot of our officers as it is for everybody in public health. Work-life balance has really been a challenge for everyone and, and continues to be right now. So I just want to be realistic. I'm glad we, our officers are, are doing a good job with that, as, at least the ones we have here today. So uh, we've had some questions. What about how much do you guys, there's a question about how much do you guys interact with each other after you're matched with your position? Is that it? Do you keep in touch with each other? What's life like as an officer? Well, I say, I'll say as a person at headquarters at CDC um, in Atlanta, there's a good number of officers that are in the Atlanta area. And oftentimes we will try to meet up to go for a hike. Um, and we do keep in touch with our, our state and local and regional officers as well via chat. And we'll, we'll see them in a couple of weeks for EIS, off, EIS conference. Um, of course, we're mostly talking about work, <laughs> um, fortunately and unfortunately, but um, we do try to find time to get together um, so there is opportunities for, for networking that way. So I'll just add to that, as an alum, one of the greatest gifts to, for me from having done EIS are my classmates. They can, some of them continue to be my, continue to be my closest friends. I just was at uh, one of my classmates' husband's 50th birthday party this weekend, and so we have things like that. It's, it's one of the greatest parts of, of being an officer is your interaction with your classmates. These officers, it's been more challenging because so much has been virtual, and as we return more to the workplace, I think we're going to get back to more of the officers really getting to physically be able to spend time with each other, but they have so many virtual ways of communicating. I don't even know all the apps that they're using. Uh, they know things before I do, and there's a lots of questions about US Public Health Service or civil service. I'm purposely ignoring all that because it has nothing to do with EIS. It doesn't matter. If you're accepted, then you'll have to make that decision and we'll discuss that with you later. Um, another thing is that if you're in, some people are saying, how do I get in touch with someone that's working in this area, that area? I encourage all of you, registration is free. Our EIS conference is May 2nd through 6th. It is coming up, it is virtual, it's online. And there you'll be able to see the full range and spectrum of the work of our officers. And if you see someone that's interested in something, you'll be able to then uh, identify them and you can reach out and contact them and they'd be glad to talk to you about their work. All right, we're about to run out of time, but I think one of the things people wanna know is, what are your plans for after EIS? So Miriam, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um... So I recently accepted a position in the National Center for Chronic Disease 
um, and health promotion. I'll be working with an EIS alum, actually, um, in the physical activity and health branch. So looking forward to working in that area. Ariel? Um, I will be staying on in the, lo the local health department. So at Maricopa County Department of Public Health, being their public health scientist, working on non-COVID activities, which basically means I will be their subject matter expert epidemiologist across um, all the comorbidities that um, the Office of Epidemiology covers, which includes infectious diseases, um, drug use, et cetera. So staying local. Richard. Yeah, so um, similar to Ariel, I'm hoping to stay at a local or state health department. I'm currently in the application process, so applying to a variety of positions and uh, trying to, and going through the interviews and um, trying to make a decision at the moment about that. Um, but yeah, I, one of the things I did want to kind of tie back to uh, one of the comments that, that Eric made is one of the one of the great things that I've learned over the last couple of weeks now that I've joined this like the jobs search process is there is an inherent network of EIS alumni at state and local health departments and it doesn't matter if you've worked with them previously or they could have done EIS 10-15 years ago. Um, one of the great things while doing this job search is identifying those persons who have done EIS before and being able to have a conversation with them and have this connection of a joint experience with them. And that's one of the things that I've really enjoyed over the last couple of weeks of the job search. And I think that's one of the many, many benefits of doing EIS. Thank you, Richard. All right, so we're about to run out of time. I'm sorry, I tried to get to as many of your questions as possible, and I'm, I'm sorry we couldn't answer all of them. Again, uh, some general tips are, if you haven't worked at a state or local public health department, go do it. Uh, if you're interested in opportunities at CDC, cdc.gov backslash fellowships. Anything about EIS, cdc.gov backslash EIS. And our conference is May 2nd through 6th. It's one of the best ways in additional to this webinar to really learning more about all the insides and outs of the great work that these officers do. So thank you. Over to Aaron. Thank you so much, Eric. So I hate that we ran out of time. I know you guys all have a lot of questions. Please visit the links that we shared in the chat. I want to thank um, Dr. Eric Pesner, our EIS uh, lead, as well as all of our distinguished uh, panelists for sharing their personal experiences. We do hope that you now have a significant interest in pursuing EIS. Um, reminder, if you have program questions, send them to eisapplications at cdc.gov. Um, if you're interested in speaking more in depth with one of our um, alumni or fellows, you can create an account on Handshake and visit our CDC fellowships page and talk even in more depth with some of our alumni and fellows. Um, finally, before we adjourn, I really uh, would appreciate it if you would fill out our, our feedback link that I shared in the chat. We'd really value your feedback and it will help us continuously improve these webinars to make sure they're meeting your needs. So that concludes our session. Um, thank you everyone for joining and we hope you have a fantastic day. <laughs>